Thank you very much, Celia, and thank you, uh, Kirsten, from the uh, RCI for uh, organizing this. Uh, and also, I'd like to thank uh, the folks at Mosaic Press, uh, uh, Howard and Jeanette, who came here today uh, with some books, but also, uh, I think, to just listen and, uh, and have fun. Uh, so uh, Celia already talked a little bit about my background, uh, but uh, the book was actually co-written with uh, someone else, so I'd like to also talk about my co-author, uh, Isaias Almada. Uh, if you get the book and uh, you open up to the uh, uh, dedication page, you see that the book is dedicated to Leonardo, and then we say comma, uh, son and grandson. Uh, Leonardo happens to be my son and Isaiah's grandson, and that's all I'm going to tell you. You're going to have to figure the rest uh, out. And, uh, and, and i give you another hint, Isaiah's is not my father. Uh, Isaiah's was, uh, is a uh, novelist uh, uh, and a, a screenplay writer, and, and uh, 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 formerly uh, uh, he worked in advertising in Brazil and won many awards for his fiction and for uh, uh, adaptations for movies. And uh, he was here visiting uh, his grandson uh, several years ago uh, in 2000, Christmas 2011. <clears throat> And, and I had dinner with him, and uh, he was telling me that he was in between projects, and, uh, and uh, I said, okay, look, I uh, uh, got an idea for you, because uh, this was, if you remember, four years, or well, three years or so after the financial crisis, and I had been studying a lot the uh, mathematics and the economics of the uh, financial crisis, which I'm going to tell you in, in a moment, uh, since 2008. And uh, at, at one point, it occurred to me that, uh, you know, as we're going to discuss, many of the uh, famous uh, crashes in history, uh, dating back to, you know, the tulip mania in, in, in Holland, uh, they always have some element of uh, mischief, some, some quirky uh, uh, character or organization or, or, or circumstances uh, that make you uh, pause and wonder, is, well, is, is this really? as, uh, uh, you know, random and unexpected as, as, as people say it is. And, and, and then I told this to Isaias and I said, and, and you wouldn't take a good writer uh, too much effort to have, you know, a little bit of a leap of, of, of imagination to say that all those seemingly disconnected episodes of mischief uh, might have been actually all orchestrated by the same organization. And, uh, you know, his eyes went like this, and, and he said, well, do you mind if I pursue this idea? I said, go ahead. I'm not going to do it. I'm not a writer, so I'm just suggesting it to you. And he said, well, uh, here's what we can do. Uh, I think I have to put this here, otherwise it's going to keep falling. Uh, here's what we can do. Uh, I, we can start researching this together and reading the same uh, background material and, and then exchanging ideas. And when I start actually writing it, you can serve as a consultant because I need someone who actually understands the, the history and the technical aspects of it uh, to, to uh, prevent me from making, making mistakes and not saying something that it's uh, uh, accurate. I said, sure, that I can do. I'm, I'm very busy. I was just starting a new job at the Fields Institute, but I thought that you know, doing that kind of consulting uh, would, would be a fun thing. And, and then we did do that correspondence for, for many, many months. And then uh, a, a long time later, uh, the first uh, actual uh, uh, a piece of fictional writing, so six chapters of, of the first draft uh, uh, arrived on my Dropbox. And, and if, you, if you look at the book now, it has 52 chapters, so six is not that, that much, but it was enough to give the, the, the flavor of what he was going for. And, and then I, I got, and, and you know, I loved it, every, every line of it, but I you know, wrote a lot. I made uh, suggestions and modifications, as I said, and, and, and you know, this character should be introduced here, and look, it could be there, and the timeline could be this and could be that. So, so what I sent back to him was you know, about two or three times larger than the chapter chapters that came in, and then he wrote back and said, look, that's not what consultants do. <laughs> so, so you either change what you do or we change your role in this. Uh, if, if we're going to be doing the way you're doing, then we need to co-write this. Then you're going to be a co-author. Co and, and then I, I thought for a moment, it was a really busy period in my life, but I thought, hey, 
uh, why not do this? And if I don't do it, uh, I'll, I'll regret forever. And I said, yes, let's let's do it. Uh, and and then we started. And and this was at about we're talking already 2013, going into 2014. And then from that point on, we really uh, did everything kind of 50/50. Uh, of course, it's uh, uh, my first experience in writing uh, fiction. I had many other papers uh, with with co-authors in in math and economics, uh, and, and and it's very different in fiction because you you know when you're doing a technical paper, it's very easy to just come in and correct something. And but if you're correcting somebody's uh, story, you know what are you basing it? What is the what is the right thing to do? No, it's not. So so you need to take a, a you know alternate. Uh, uh, roles of, of, you know, sometimes one person is driving the story and the other person is uh, uh, commenting and critiquing and sometimes it's, it's the other way around. And, and we found a really good way of doing that and, 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 and we're very uh, uh, happy uh, uh, doing it that way. So, so that's the background for the book. Uh, I want to then now from, from here on alternate between uh, parts of the book and a little bit of uh, history and, and economics and uh, I, I talk too much uh, so if you have questions along the way you should not you know uh, uh, hold them to the end if you want to wait until the end that's fine I'll be very happy to discuss more but if there are points where you just go ahead and raise your hand and then we, we talk about it. Um, so, so, so let me, me go right, right away on what I had uh, uh, prepared here. So the book opens in, in what we call the Lehman Weekend. So this was in 2008. This was the weekend in September when most people became aware of the, of the financial crisis. Of course, it was uh, going on for a long time, since 2007. Uh, but on that weekend, it really hit the, the headlines. And, and uh, I'm going to start with the prologue of the book. And uh, it's based on what actually happened uh, that weekend, but with a little twist uh, towards the end. So, so this is probably the part that I'm going to read the most. The other parts are just really uh, uh, single lines or paragraphs that I want to give as examples. But here, here's the entire prologue. It's only two pages. Lehman Weekend, September 12 to 14, 2008, New York City, USA. Hank Paulson managed to get Alistair Darling on the phone at 11.30 on, Saturday, on Sunday morning. The Treasury Secretary was speaking to his British counterpart from the 13th floor of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in a makeshift office that Tim, Ga Tim Geithner, the president of the New York Fed, had arranged for him. Paulson and Geithner, along with dozens of other Fed and Treasury officials, had been bunkered down at the Renaissance Revival Fortress on Liberty Street since Friday night when Geithner had summoned the CEOs of the most important banks in the country for an emergency meeting to avoid an impending financial Armageddon. We all know why we are here, were Paulson's opening remarks to the CEOs. Without an intervention, Lehman Brothers will not be able to reopen on Monday. This will have to be a private bailout. Neither the Fed nor the Treasury has the legal authority to rescue Lehman. Geithner made clear before they broke the night, broke for the night on Friday. Come back in the morning and be prepared to do something. Many of the men in the room, and they were all men, were aware of how closely their meeting resembled a gathering that had taken place 10 years before, also at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Then, representatives from the world's largest banks, including those same banks whose executives now sat in front of Paulson and Geithner on this Friday, had met to decide the fate of a sinking hedge fund. Notably absent from the current meeting were representatives from the only two banks that had refused to assist in the 1998 bailout, Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. The more historically minded in the room also thought further back to the early years of the 20th century. They had in mind the fable meeting convened by John Pierpont, Pierpont Morgan Sr. in 1907. According to legend, Morgan locked himself and his peers inside his library on Madison Avenue and pocketed the key until they would agree to commit sufficient funds to stop the panic that then threatened to destroy Amer the American banking system. 
the trauma caused by that episode, particularly the fear that someone like JP Morgan might not be around for the next crisis, convinced a reluctant Congress to create the Federal Reserve System some six years later. On Saturday morning, Paulson greeted the reassembled group of bankers with news that Barclays, the British bank, had emerged as a potential purchaser of Lehman. There were two sticking points, though. Barclays needed the approval of the British government to complete the deal in a short time frame. And Barclays won't take all the Lehman toxic assets, Paulson declared. You need to help finance a competitor or deal with the failure of, or deal with the failure of Lehman. It was not to be. There is no way I'm going to allow Barclays to buy Lehman, declared the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Alistair Darling, when Paulson reached him on Sunday morning. You are asking the British government to take on too big a risk, was Darling's only explanation to Paulson for refusing to allow the purchase to go ahead. With no other buyers in sight and the US government refusing to step in, Lehman's time was up. By that afternoon, the once mighty financial group was the subject of bankruptcy proceedings, heralding the start of a new, much more severe chapter in the global financial crisis. The British screwed us, was how Paulson summarized the news when he addressed the CEOs shortly before 1 p.m. The news reverberated like shockwaves through the teams of accountants, lawyers, and investment bankers gathered in different floors of the building who knew they had little time to switch to full damage control mode, whether they worked for one of the banks or for the government. For most gathered, gathered at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Darling's refusal to allow the sale was incomprehensible. A select few, however, sensed the invisible handiwork of a centuries-old shadowy organization with roots in medieval Italy. So everything in that prologue is true, except the last paragraph. <laughs> or is it? So from that point, we start the book. And the book now has uh, what I call three uh, threads uh, uh, for the narrative. Uh, one is the actual development of the crisis, but of course we started at the Lehman weekend, but we need to backtrack a little bit to explain a few things. So we go back a few weeks and trace what happens to central banks and the people involved and, and uh, slowly are introduced to this shadowy organization. The other thread is, uh, as I'm going to introduce in a second, uh, a little earlier in the story again, so about August uh, of 2008, is uh, when we meet the two that are going to become the protagonists of the story. They are a young couple. One is a postdoc doing mathematical finance uh, at Columbia University. I never attended Columbia, so it's not based on it. Uh, who is half American, half Italian. And because he's Italian, he has had, you know, over the years, his family telling stories about their own family history and uh, interconnected with the history of banking. And uh, Sara, uh, who is uh, a, a she, she becomes involved with this character because of the research that they're doing at the public library, but she happens to be working for Timothy Geithner in New York. So that's the second thread. And the third thread, it's all the way back to what the prologue mentions, medieval Italy. So it's in the 1300s. It's where the first uh, banks are created. So now I want to read you a short uh, par paragraph from each of this. And, and, and we do that in a very, dare I say, mathematical way, that we have these three chapters. The crisis narrative, the couple and their discoverings and, and adventures, and then medieval Italy, always in the same sequence. So the reader starts to get a rhythm for what follows what. So after you read more about the crisis, you learn more about what the couple are up to, and then you learn more about the banks in Italy, and then you go back to the crisis, and then you continue in a, in a cycle. So, so from the uh, chapter where we're talking about uh, the crisis and the shadowy organization, so this is. Uh, about uh, is when we're introduced to Monsieur Henri, who is a very secretive, uh, rich gentleman who lives in the Ardennes forest in Belgium. 
and controls the organization from inside his very private library. So his, his, him thinking to himself, it was time for his organization to take the reins of the current financial crisis, as it had done so many times in the past. This episode, like many, others, many other crises before, was about to become a lot worse before it could improve. It was part of the protocol. The details differed in each crisis, but the final outcome was certain. Preservation of the wealth and power of the members of his organization. The only necessary condition for a successful outcome was obedience, both from the select members of the Brotherhood and from the wider web of politicians and central bankers they control. And then he develops a bit more of the background. Then we go to the other chapter, where it starts with uh, the introduction to our hero, the hero of the story, William Benjamin F. And F will be revealed later what it stands for. Hubbard, born in Stanford, Connecticut, almost 30 years ago, of an American father and an Italian mother, Princeton graduate, affectionately nicknamed Wilby by his mother, when still in his early years, a play of words for good augury, as she used to say took a seat at his favorite table by one of the mirror columns of the Cafe Tallulah on Columbus Avenue, not far from, far from where he lived, in New York. Uh, the Cafe Tallulah used to exist. I had coffee there and in the uh, mirrored walls and everything. Now it's closed, unfortunately. Maybe with the success of the book, they'll try to open it. <laughs> Talks more about his uh, life and then uh, he's at the Cafe Tallulah because the shopkeeper's bell above the front door rang and will be waited as Sarah made her way across the cafe towards him. Just under five feet, seven inches tall, with lively eyes and few freckles on her face, she wore a little gray suit over a white blouse and only a little makeup, just enough to sharpen her youth. Her red hair was styled with metal clips and her feet were clad in braided leather sandals. So they talk a bit about you know, why they're there and uh, the research that she's doing for him at the library and ends the chapter by saying this. Sarah stared back at Wilby as if she were weighing up whether to proceed. Eventually she spoke. I don't know if this is what you're looking for, but given what you just said, you have to go back and see what he said, it might be something. Sarah paused and added at last. Have you ever heard of something called the Venetian Files. Before Wilby could answer, Sarah noticed a change in expression and a slight loss of color in her friend's face. And then with that, we move to Italy in the 1300s. And the chapter starts, and, and then you know, the, the tone of each of the chapters is, is uh, on purpose very different. When we're talking about the crisis, it's very journalistic. And, and uh, as, aside from the you know, philosophical uh, thoughts of, of Monsieur Henri, when you talk about the two doing their adventures, it's very flirtatious and quick. And, uh, and you, you know, we just want to, to follow this young couple and see what they're doing. And when we're back to uh, the 1300s in Italy, it's like this. The delicate snowflakes of what was going to be an unforgettable winter for the village of Vicenza already covered the smaller shrubs, some late blooming flowers of the surrounding area, and the vine vi vineyards of much of the region, not far from the Dolomites in the Italian Tyrol, a land good for grapes and grappa. So you see what the tone of the chapter is. And in that chapter, we are introduced to uh, Giuseppe and uh, uh, Luigi. Giuseppe is a rich merchant in uh, the north part of Italy who is up to some revolutionary ideas. And he wants to confide and, and talk with his uh, good friend, Friar Luigi. And we'll talk more about them a bit later. Uh, in the narrative of the crisis, we didn't want to only talk about uh, real things. So we needed to make some made up stuff and uh, to catch the reader's attention because you know you all read the journalistic accounts of the crisis so we needed to do more things so we killed someone <laughs> <laughs> i was uh, attended a talk by uh, isabella allende when i was in california and she was uh, telling about a book that she was uh, writing i had great fun because in the first chapter she killed someone and then in the second chapter, she killed somebody else. And in the third chapter, she killed somebody else. And then she had written about nine chapters, and now she needed to think, what was she going to do with all these dead people? Uh, and, and we were not like that. We only, well, 
maybe only killed one person. <laughs> But, but this is how we killed this person, and this person is going to play a very essential role throughout the book, and you're going to have to read and, uh, and understand. But I'll go back to that moment, so if you have good memory, just remember this uh, paragraph. Uh, the red rays of evening light reflected off the wavelets of the Grand Canal and disappeared behind the architectural silhouettes of hundreds of Byzantine, Gothic, and neoclassical homes and palaces in that most stunning of cities at sunset. Venice. It being late summer, the city's streets and squares were flooded with people, its hotels, churches, and museums overflowing with awestruck tourists. Nowadays it's flooded with more than people, but it is. This splendid session could not hide the strange sight that confronted a few of the tourists who, their attention roused by a dull thud, that was a dull thud right there. Mm momentarily directed their gazes towards an arched passageway along the Grand Canal. A man, elegantly dressed in tailcoat and black bow tie, jumped from a small bridge into a smaller canal. Soaked by the sudden immersion, the man still managed, without apparent effort, to lift himself onto a gondola, silently disappearing through a narrow corridor of green water. As the gondola rounded a corner and slipped from view, a woman's scream rang close to where the man in tailcoat had jumped. Prompting a group of passers-by in the alleyway to hurry to where she stood, shaken. On the ground, another man, also elegantly dressed, twitched as he clutched the hilt of a Japanese katana lodged in his bowels. There was little chance the unknown man would survive. So, uh, so that's the, that's the essential uh, uh, dramatic narrative of the story. Now, of course, this man is dead, and we need to explain why that happens, and there's a detective that tries to, you know, he's a, an Italian detective, so he had great fun, you know, portraying how this Italian guy behaves. And, 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 but along the way, we had to do more, a little bit more uh, sort of uh, solid explanations. So, for example, what, what is there in this uh, so-called Venetian files? So why, why are they so important? Uh, so let me just flip here. But just before that, uh, oh, page 45. Yes, so just, you know, how do these Venetian files come, come to exist and why are they important? Well, of course, it's from that encounter that I mentioned to you between uh, Giuseppe and, uh, and, and uh, uh, Friar Luigi. And, and we spent several chapters in just one scene in a monastery where Giuseppe is introducing to Luigi the idea that things are changing in the Middle Ages at that point. It's just the 1300s. Uh, the world is changing around them. As a man of the world, he understands that and he tries to convey this to Luigi. So he says, Luigi, open your eyes. Leave the monastery for a bit. The world is not going to be divided as it is now between kings and subjects, or popes and churchgoers, noblemen and serfs, rich and poor. These times are creating a new type of man, more forward-looking, more ambitious, less fearful of God, one who will make money his new God, and in that way be better at using his wealth. I never thought I would hear you say such things, Giuseppe. May God forgive you. But from what I understand, you are suggesting that the two of us should join this new cast of men. Not only join it, Luigi, but lead it. And then he explains a little bit more what this new word is going to be like and gets to his final point. He says, Giuseppe paused theatrically to check whether his friend followed his line of thought. He continued in a solemn voice. It is here that the banking house comes into play. Our banking house. A banking house, repeated Luigi. We create our banking house, manage our own fortune with reasonable safety, and we begin to receive proper compensation for the risks we are exposed in our business. For example, suppose we stock a ship with a large quantity of goods and it's attacked by pirates in the high seas or hit by a storm that makes us lose half of the shipment. What can we do? Against Satan or the forces of nature, there's nothing one can do. Only God, and that's why you're wrong again, Luigi. 
It is precisely here that you are wrong. We have arrived at the point, at one of the key points, if not the central point that I'm trying to make. But perhaps we need a little bit more wine, no? Any more wine and I cannot be held accountable for my actions or my thoughts. Va bene, let's pause and take a wander through the monastery's garden, shall we? A little bit of fresh air is always good. It reanimates the spirit and opens the door for new ideas. Let's go. So what is going on there is that, of course, Giuseppe is trying to, to explain that by controlling banking, by controlling finances, you are above the kings, above the, the uh, uh, church even, and, and Luigi is, is uh, you know, resisting that idea, but eventually buys into that. But because he cannot do that too forcefully and too openly, he starts writing down notes for himself of, of these uh, changes and, and what to do with them and how to protect themselves. And those notes eventually become the, the so-called uh, Venetian files. Uh, the, uh, through Luigi, we have an opportunity to, to explain many historical and philosophical ideas, but also through Monsieur Henri. And in fact, throughout the book is kind of a dialogue between the two. Luigi is, after all, the original author of the Venetian Files, and Monsieur Henri is one of the guardians of the Venetian Files these days. So by reading, they communicate, as one often does with, uh, with uh, important pieces of, of literature. So, so they have this dialogue. And uh, for example, here is Monsieur Henri talking about uh, money now. He says, money stood at the center of all they did in the form of gold, silver, nickel, precious gems, or, or paper. Each in its own time was exchanged for goods and services, or as backing for other types of promises, such as stocks, which are just parcels of participation in the capital of large corporations. And here we, we have an opportunity to explain some uh, important economic concepts. For example, what is money? In its essence, money is simply a promise capable of creating a world of progress, realizations, ways of acting and thinking. Or put differently, an illusion to be permanently confronted with the naked reality of an increasingly complex life. The reality of survival, of accumulation of wealth, and the many advantages and maladies it brings. But the mechanisms, the path, and above all, the shortcuts for accumulating wealth can also become an illusion, or else reality playing a sick joke. Greed and power, command and obedience. So that's one, one of the uh, funds that we have with these characters is putting some serious economic thought but through the, their mouth. And we're going to see a little bit more of that, if I can find it. Uh, yes. So I, I said that this was Monsieur Henri in the 20th century talking about money. And this is the counterpart, uh, Luigi talking about money in the 13th, in the 14th century. Money started to take new forms in feudal society, not only in the form of metal, mostly gold and silver, but also the novelty of bills, billetes, sign letters promising delivery of physical products, primary grains sometimes in the future in exchange for borrowed funds. Hope and uncertainty moved all, winners and losers in each transaction, even when they were not fully conscious of it, towards a world that could no longer exist solely between heaven and hell, between kings and popes imposing their rules and dogmas, between the cross and the sword. Life blossomed in the squares of villages and cities that, knew, that grew beyond the liturgy of the church and palace deals. Streets bustled with activity outside the religious processions and celebrations of queens and kings. Underneath it all, all was the nascent idea that progress, the future, was in the hands of common men and not in the cold grandiosity of chancels and the ostentation of gold and broil in royal ballrooms. So it's a really important moment in human history, the beginning of the modern age, and we're trying to capture a little bit uh, of that. Uh, I'll have only a few more examples like that, and, 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 and then we can open up for discussion. How am I doing with the time? It's not too bad, right, Kirsten? Time is fine. Uh, the other uh, important concept uh, that we introduce, wait a second, I need to find the page, 102, is that of central banks, of course, because we say throughout the book that the society uh, uh, controls 
the, the, the politicians and finance ministers and central bankers, but, but why do they control that and, and, and what kind of things central banks do? So uh, most people have an intuitive understanding of central banks. They're a branch of the government, they work with banks, but what actually do they do and, and, and in reality and also in our fictional world here, how they get controlled by this organization. So this is a, a passage from Monsieur Henri reflecting on central banks. He says, most people accept that a functioning economy needs a lender of last resort. That, that's what most people think of central banks as doing. It is easy to understand that banks need the confidence of depositors and that when this confidence is gone, even the most solvent ones crumble. The trick has always been to know to whom to lend, when and how much. The golden rule, or the Badgett rule, Badgett was the uh, first editor of The Economist, and he wrote a book uh, about uh, central banking, and this is his rule. Counsels that in a panic, central banks should lend freely at high rates to solvent banks. But who is to say which banks are solvent? This is Monsieur Henri thinking. The history of central banking is littered with episodes of commercial banks being rescued one year only to fail the next, or banks that could have been rescued but were left to fail for no apparent reason other than the caprice of whoever was making the decisions. Conspiracy theories abound, for example, of Protestant central bankers punishing banks ran by Catholics. Monsieur Henri knew better. The rule is that there is no rule. Central banks would always eventually step in to save the system, but they should keep everyone guessing about the fate of each individual bank. So this is Monsieur Henri saying, but this sentence is literal from manuals about economic policy. That's how it should be done, but I'm putting here through the, the, the words of Monsieur Henri. Preventing moral hazard was the usual justification. Now it's uh, my twisted version. So the usual justification, yes, is preventing mor moral hazard. What is moral hazard? If every bank expected to be rescued, the idea goes, they would become reckless and take on excessive risk. But again, Monsieur Henri knew that there was more to it. For people who think moral hazard is the real problem actually tend to argue that the best way to prevent it is not to rescue any bank. Abolish central banks altogether. Let the markets decide the fate of failing banks. Let a financial crisis run its course. What a silly concept, says Ms. Monsieur Henri. The truth is that we don't know what would happen if a financial crisis were allowed to run its course because this has never been allowed to occur. Public opinion has no stomach to see a crisis through, even if the end result is to reduce the chances of future crisis. The pain is too great. Present reality always wins over future planning. No. And this is key for the entire book. Preventing moral hazard was not the reason behind letting some banks fail. The key was to cause enough havoc to remind the public how ugly a financial crisis can become. Remind them why they have a central bank to begin with. And that's what this secret society is doing all through history. They let the crisis just go enough so that people say, no, save us, we need something, and then there's the rescue. Because otherwise, you, you know, if the rescue comes too early and nobody fails, no banks fail, then they would not, not, not be scared enough of the financial crisis. And that's the, that's the game that they've been playing uh, uh, for all the centuries. Oops. Uh, Okay, so that's done for the central bank. And, and then now I'm coming to uh, more or less the last economic concept that I, that I want to talk about. And then I'll just read a couple of funny uh, passages. But the, the last, economic con last two economic concepts, and these were uh, tougher because they are uh, more arcane. So I had to introduce a character that could do this in a good way. So I created or based it on someone who actually exists, but I'm not going to tell you who he is, on a professor from Columbia who happens to be Wilby's mentor. And this man is a brilliant mathematician at Columbia, but has a tendency of uh, believing in conspiracy theories. And so Wilby and Sarah go to, to this man's place 
for dinner in New York, and his wife, Matilda, so the man is called uh, uh, Pfeiffer, Donaldson Pfeiffer, Don Pfeiffer, and in the book, you have to now figure out who he is in reality. Just gave you enough hints so you can find the Columbia website to try to find who the person is. Uh, and, and you know, they're having, they're having this really uh, pleasant dinner and they're talking, and now I need to uh, talk to you about uh, uh, what Donald Pfeiffer does. So, so it's, a, it's a, let me see how long this is because it's, okay. Uh, this is to introduce the concept, and this was a, a, a cool challenge. And, and I'm going to read this because I, I, I'm proud of it because it was, so you, can, you understand, Isaias is the actual writer, right? So most of the time he was crafting the sentences, creating the dialogues, and I was modifying and proposing. This one I did, so it's one of the few that I did myself, okay? <laughs> because because it's, on, it's to introduce the concept of double entry bookkeeping, okay? Now, if you're not an accountant, you never get excited about double entry bookkeeper. <laughs> but I want to make you excited about double entry bookkeeper. So this is the challenge I put to myself, how to talk about double entry bookkeeping in a dinner party in New York. <laughs> <laughs> so here's Donald, uh, uh, Don Pfeiffer. That's what economists and mathematicians tend to focus when they talk about bubbles. They just talk about financial crisis. Double entry bookkeeping comes later. Very gently. I don't want to overwhelm the reader. <laughs> to talk about bubbles, to see if there is anything abnormal in the prices themselves if they are not in line with what's called fundamentals. I have done work on this myself, as you know, will be. I certainly do. He comes across as a big suck up in that chapter because it's his mentor. I certainly do, but I have a feeling you are about to tell me something different now. Yes, you see, focusing on prices, either of stocks or houses or whatever, it's a bit too narrow. There are other variables one ought to be monitoring, such as, asked Sarah, making every effort to follow the conversation that she knew was important to Wilby. How much easy money is there in the system, for example? And I don't just mean the money that is provided by central banks, as one often reads in the financial press. I'm talking about money that is created by other agents. I'm confused, Donald. I thought only the government could print money, otherwise it would be counterfeit, no? Ah, yes, Sarah, I'm very glad you mentioned this. He's slightly patronized. Uh, where am I? I'm very glad you mentioned this because it is one of the most fundamental misconceptions in all of economics, replied a radiant Professor Pfeiffer who continued, of course only the government can print pieces of paper with the faces of dead presidents on them, but that's not the only type of money there is. It isn't? Now even Wilby was a bit perplexed. <laughs> Absolutely not. When was the last time you actually used bills to pay for anything? I'm willing to bet that you use your debit card to pay for that bottle of wine you brought here tonight. Yes, I did, but I had the money in my bank account. Precisely, you had the money in your bank account, not printed dollar bills. Uh -huh. You see, the bank had a record of the size of your bank account before you bought the wine. When you use your debit card, all that it did was to decrease your account by the price of the wine and increase the account of the liquor store owner by the same amount. True. True, said Wilby, suddenly remembering how much wine the wine cost and trying not to think of the balance of his bank account after the transaction. <laughs> But I had to deposit my postdoc stipend from Colombia in my bank account to begin with. I still don't see how this was created by the bank. Very good. But do you think everyone first makes a deposit and then goes on spending? For example, when your parents bought their house back in Connecticut, did they wait year after year to deposit their salaries, saving a little bit each month until they could pay for the house? Well, no, they took a mortgage, like most people. Exactly. And where do you think the money for the mortgage came from, Sarah? Want to guess? Teased Professor Pfeiffer, trying to keep her interested in the exchange. Uh, from other clients of the bank, I suppose, she guessed. So you think his parents' bank 
had a pile of cash deposited by other clients and kept it stored away in a vault until people walked into the branch and asked for a mortgage? That sounds a little inefficient, doesn't it? It does, but how else would they find the money to lend to his parents? Excellent point, and that's precisely what's so hard to understand about money. You see, people think it's something physical, like bicycles. Surely, if you're going to lend bicycles, you need to have bicycles first, right? Right, both Wilby and Sarah agreed. But that's not the case at all with money. Here's what happened when Wilby's parents asked for a mortgage to buy a house. The bank checked that they were credit worthy and decided to give them a loan. But they didn't use cash that was sitting in the vault or called existing clients to see who would like to deposit some money so they could lend it to the lovely couple. No, risked Sarah. No, they simply increased the couple's bank account with the amount equal to the value of the loan. Just like when Wilby bought the bottle of wine and the liquor store owner had his bank account increase. Now hold on a second, protested Sarah, much to Wilby's surprise. You said in the wine example that Wilby's account would decrease by the same amount. She continued, as Wilby tried to forget the amount that had been deducted a few hours earlier. In this mortgage example, whose bank account goes down? Nobody's does. And that's the magic. But that's cheating. The bank can't just increase the amount in one account without any consequence. You're absolutely right, Sarah. But they didn't do that. But you just said that nobody's balance had to go down for his parents' balance to go up contended Sarah is slightly exasperated. Yes, I did say that, but that doesn't mean that there were no consequences. What happened was that the increase in his parents' bank account, which you sh should think of as a liability for the bank, or in other words, an amount that the bank owes to his parents, is matched one-to-one -one by an increase in the assets of the bank. In other words, the loan that his parents now must repay to the bank one day. It's a procedure called double entry bookkeeping and was actually perfected in medieval Italy, as were most things related to modern banking. The unexpected reference to a time and place that had been so fresh in their minds for the last few days shocked Wilby and Sarah. Matilda Pfeiffer returned to the dining room carrying a tray. Dessert, anyone? And that's not the end of that dinner party. Then we have a lot of chapters where a lot of things happen with the crisis and the Italy, and then I go back to the dinner party, and, and I will indulge your, your patience a little more as if you were in that dinner party in New York, so we can recreate the, how long it takes to explain that in an actual dinner party. Uh, because I want to tell you about, uh, wait a second. Minsky cycles, because that's the last thing, last economic concept. Because that's about, uh, the, also it's the core economic theory that runs through the, through the book, that financial crisis goes in cycles and at some time there's a, there's a crash. But why, why is, that, is that crash happening? So remember Matilda came in the, the, with, with a tray of dessert, she says. So what did I miss? Any outlandish theories this evening? Asked Matilda as she distributed generous portions of cake and ice cream around the table. Hardly, my darling Matilda, I was simply introducing Wilby and Sarah to some arcane concepts in accounting, joked the professor. Then they do a little bit of chit chat. Uh, and then that's, he says that he will continue more of his theory. He says, the key variable is the supply of credit which can be quite flexible, as we we're, as were just discussing with the bank account stuff. And why is that key, asked Sarah, sensing that she was about to hear something to which the professor had given a great deal of thought. Because the supply of credit tends to increase in good times and contract in bad times. So when the economy is booming, people borrow more and faster than the pace at which the economy is increasing. Sounds reasonable, everyone feels optimistic, so they don't mind borrowing to buy new things. Exactly, continued the professor. The problem is that the extra money cannot go to buy new things, as you just said. 
I think I'm going to summarize a little bit. So, so it says, you know, where, where to use the money. So he cannot go to buy new things. So he goes for his speculation. He goes to buy his speculative assets, which is, which is eventually what brings the prices of those assets up. So to purchase existing assets, explain will be. That's it. Uh, now that's quite the theory. And it says, yes, but sadly for me, it's not my theory. Sarah, but that of a man called Hyman Minsky. Perhaps you heard the name. People have been calling what's happening in the world economy a Minsky moment. That was around the financial crisis. People rediscovered Minsky. So they talk a little bit about Minsky, and then, and then it says that you know, the Minsky story has these two sides. It's the increase and then the decrease. And now comes the, the punchline. You mean when credit contracts and the bubbles burst, Ask Wilby. Exactly. Eventually, something triggers a decline, a loss of confidence that brings prices down. So could it be anything that triggers a collapse, asked Sarah. Ah, Matilda interjected ironically. My beloved wife knows me too well. Unlike some others who have investigated this question, I don't think that the triggers are quite as unpredictable or random as, the, as sometimes they appear. Are you familiar with the Dutch tulip mania of the 17th century? Are you? Yeah. <laughs> so I'll tell you a bit more about that. Not specifically, answers Sarah. Apart from the fact that some people apparently paid more than for a single flower than the price of an entire house. Isn't that right? Not exactly. You see, what the speculators were buying and selling were actually future contracts on tulip bulbs, not the flowers themselves. The most euphoric phase of the bubble took place in the winter of 1636-37, when the bulbs in question were firmly underground. Oh, I see. But that's a minor detail. The important bit is that the episode fits the Minsky model like a glove especially the fact that most of the trade took place in Amsterdam taverns, or what they call colleges, with the speculators using credit provided by the owners of the taverns to bid on the tulip contracts. In other words, drinking credit played the role of bank credit. Did you know that? I didn't know that. It's quite funny. But that's not all. Nobody can know for sure what triggered the collapse in price of tulip futures, but one hypothesis is that proper tulip merchants, you know, as opposed to the drunken speculators, started handing out satirical pamphlets, and this is true, handing out satirical pamphlets outside the taverns, warning people of the dangers of speculative investment. Yeah, joking. Not at all. They wanted to push the price down and end the party. Why? Because it was bad for the legitimate tulip business to have all this amateur speculation going on, I suppose. And a similar pattern, remember when I started this talk, it was my motivation. And the similar pattern can be seen in other more recent episodes. The point is that in every major bubble in history, the trigger event looks very suspicious. Here we go, smiled Matilda. It's almost, continued Professor Pfeiffer, as if each episode, ep each case, the people in charge, you know, the captains of the economy, wanted the bubble to burst at a specific moment. The people in charge? Asks an incredulous will be. You believe a group of people are in charge of the world economy? Com complimented Sarah timidly. You don't? When I question the links between the Bush family, for example, and the Saudi oil oligarchs, people say that I'm a conspiracy theorist. But so what? Et voila, explained a satisfied Matilde. <laughs> so so that, that was it for the uh, uh, economic background. And you have to read the rest of the book to see how it develops. I just wanted to give you just uh, two short excerpts. One thing is that we talk about food a lot in the book. Isaiah is a food enthusiast. I didn't read anything, but there are entire scenes where you know they're having dinner and a, and a full recipe just rolls off. For example, Wilby and Sarah visit their parent, their uh, family in uh, in Italy, and the uh, aunt uh, Antonella, the main course was a specialty from Antonella's home: Neapolitan ragu. Beef cubes, garlic, onion, olive oil, two glasses of red wine, and an abundance of tomato sauce cooked for about three hours. 
There you go. And I tried the recipe, and it's delicious. <laughs> and now for really the uh, end of it, uh, a lot of happens towards the end of the book. All these uh, threads come together. Uh, I'm not going to tell you who died right at the beginning, but uh, there's a siren will be in Venice walking into a boat on the Grand Canal. From inside the boat, they heard a splash, followed a few moments later by a woman's scream. As they looked towards the small bridge, they could see a man, soaked but elegantly dressed in tailcoat and black tie, lifting himself onto a gondola without apparent effort and disappearing in silence through a narrow corridor of green water. Thank you.